uh, Gerber, uh, who is a uh, executive director of Emirates, uh, and he'll tell us what that organization uh, does and what uh, what they're doing. But he's going to tell us um, how people are decarbonizing around the country and uh, uh, what is involved in that, particularly in terms of how we keep track of all the transactions in renewables. So uh, Ben, uh, by training, is a lawyer. He has worked in energy law, but he has also done a lot of work with government liaison and representation of law interests in front of the uh, Minnesota legislation and also the Public Utility Commission. Uh, uh, he sounds very excited about the job he has, and I'm very, very keen to hear uh, uh, about uh, what uh, the organization does. And he agreed to give us a seminar, so I'm absolutely delighted to, uh, to welcome uh, Ben Gerber, and please join me uh, to thank uh, Ben for taking the time to talk to us. So Ben, it's all yours. Thank you, Professor. Um, and I love doing this. I, I love talking to, to um, graduate or, or undergraduate classes, uh, not only about what I do, but uh, I think last week I was talking to a state legislators uh, a class at the Humphrey Institute in, in the University of Minnesota about my, my own personal politics. And um, so it got, it got interesting. Uh, the college has changed. I graduated in 05 and, and, and law school in 2010. Um, so things have changed a lot even since then. But uh, here to talk about what I do on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, a little bit about what MRETS uh, does. And, and um, I, I prefer kind of more conversational. So I, I don't know, Professor, if, if, unless you are against it, if people want to ask questions or- um, we, allow, we allow everything. This is still okay. a free country. Before yeah, <laughs> questions, so for just know. a little bit. Um, uh, please like feel free to jump in and interrupt me and ask me questions or challenge me. I, I welcome that. I mean, that's what we're all here for. That's what you're here for. Um, so here's a, just a brief agenda. And I have some slides um, that I, um, I'm happy they're, they're for public distribution and to kind of give you an understanding of what I do. Um, I, I think really, I, I wanted to talk about what, what we've done as a, as, as a become a software company um, and then what is happening in the market. Some of the things that we're working on with um, some large you know, the household names that you've heard of, but also what we're trying to do um, a, a, on a compliance level. And then um, some of the things to leave you with some questions to ponder. Uh, a little bit about MRAT. So we, um, this is our, our nonprofit mission. We were actually started by the state of Minnesota and Wisconsin as a 501c4. Um, it's a little bit weird. Uh, so we, we had an, a, an outside um, software provider that um, managed the software for us until, um, uh, December 2017, I came into the organization and really saw the future of environmental commodities um, and the need to bring more data into the hands of our users um, through the use of APIs and, um, and, and as you know, um, is, is engineers. Uh, I know some of you are software engineers, but also just um, mechanical or electrical engineers, the importance of data and energy. I will tell you, um, if you haven't experienced this now, the energy industry is uh, woefully behind in their uh, not only their acceptance of uh, innovative technologies but their their uh, their their use of it um, uh, uh, a lot of people are are, are are surprised to know that for example um, the miso markets most of the settlements are still done through self attestations you tell the market what you what you've um, injected into the grid and they provide you uh, a receipt. There's an internal market monitor that, that does audits, but it still um, takes them 55 days to get the self attestations, right? We use S55 data, um, uh, which is frustrating for us. We wish it was better, but the S14 data, which is the, 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 the next or earliest, uh, so 14 days after the, the end of the settlement period is only 80% accurate. And when we generate over 100 million megawatt hours a year, 20%, is, a, is too big of a rounding error. So um, I, the, uh, uh, I went uh, a little off track there, but just to, to let you know, um, we really think about these things um, and it make, what makes us unique as a 501c4 um, is that we can be really transparent with our users. Um, the other big thing is, is our, our name, um, uh, uh, 
I use the example in Minnesota of like 3M, which stands for Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing, or no one knows that no one knows that anymore, uh, or a lot of people don't. Um, that MRET uh, stands for the Midwest Renewable Energy Tracking System, but we track in all states and provinces. Uh, I do a lot of international development work with groups like NARUC. If you're not familiar with them, you should look them up. Um, I've gone to Mexico City. I've sent my staff to Mexico City through um, joint uh, NARUC USAID projects to teach Mexican energy regulators what we do. Um, so we really, um, we do a lot of um, international speaking and, and best practices uh, through the organization as well. So it's, it's a really simple um, uh, question asked, but why would you use a certificate tracking system? Why do we exist? I'm going to show you what RECs look like. But um, um, in the early 2000s, as there were movements among state legislatures to, 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 to really quantify um, uh, the percentages of renewable energy the different states used, um, there was a need to track it. And I, I don't know if, um, if, if you have a, a, an aggressive group that answers question, but I, I'm kind of curious if anyone out here knows or has ideas why state RPS is, what were the really main drivers behind them? I'll just give you, if anyone wants to jump in and give their, their, their understanding of why. Hi, this is Kevin Chalmers. Um, we've worked together a little bit, Ben. Uh, my thought is, uh, is to generate, promote uh, renewable or funding to generate renewable portfolios, uh, wind uh, through the utility. Mm -hmm. Obviously, yeah. in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was uh, like, like, interestingly, I mean, everyone has their own ideas, and it's hard if you look at legislative history to nail it down. But a lot of it was economic development. I mean, if you think about um, in, in the Midwest, a lot of these were passed outside of Iowa, which is the first one, which was in the 1980s. A lot of them were economic development, recovering from the recession to have like local, um, you know, domestic renewable energy produced. Uh, some of it was. Uh, you know, air quality, water quality, things like that. But a lot of it really was economic development, um, which is always interesting because I think they've really turned in to a way to decarbonize. And that's not bad, but what I'm gonna get to is that we've created a tool that, uh, that is, is, while it's set up nicely to achieve that goal, it needs some more work. And, um, but the nice thing about it is we have these markets that are set up uh, and, and we'll talk about how we wanna innovate them uh, but really, the, the, the idea behind tracking everything is, is you want to have um, a web-based system uh, that, that can do uh, everything so it can be accessed by regulators and, and by users. Uh, compliance is a huge piece of what we do. We, we started rec markets and renewable uh, electricity markets really began with the idea of, of building for uh, state mandates to, to drive, uh, as we said, multiple goals. Um, People are free to disagree uh, on whether it was purely uh, it wasn't purely jobs or wasn't purely uh, renewable energy uh, development. But then um, uh, well, in California, it became jobs. Yep. And I think some of the other states have uh, also gone that way. But I would also underline today how little role those uh, RPSs play versus what's going on in terms of the corporate market and so forth. Where, where, which gives a much bigger push in terms of renewable development. Right, and I'm going to get to some of the NREL data as well to, to, to kind of uh, emphasize that. But then um, within these markets, liquidity is really important. So the ability to transact uh, is, is really critical. Um, so there's, there's really two types of registries in, in the US um, and globally, there's GATS or GIS registries. They track all generation and emissions so there's two of those in, in the US. There's the Neepool GIS um, system, which does all generation and provides um, a residual mix. Although when you talk to a lot of corporate users, they don't actually use the residual mix because they don't trust it there. Um, and then there's RETs or REC tracking systems, which only uh, track renewable energy. Our system, our board has approved us to track everything, but nobody's really paying us to track uh, coal. Um, and what's interesting is while well, Neepool being kind of isolated in its own RTO, they made a decision they want to do that. Um, this becomes rather political when you, if we required uh, North Dakota, well, we couldn't require them to do anything, but if we said we want all your coal information, your natural gas, it's the same with South Dakota and Minnesota, um, without political uh, or legislation or, or other things, it would be very hard to get states to, to offer that information. 
Although, as we'll talk about, corporates want that. One of the biggest uh, impediments to driving renewable growth is the lack of access to, to data and being able to figure out what they can do. Salesforce, for instance, just re uh, released a, a white paper. Um, you can Google it, uh, um, or if not, I can provide the link where they talk about um, creating it, having more than just renewable energy procurement to talking about um, how they could track all these different goals, um, including you know, figuring out that uh, uh, putting solar in a West Virginia, in West Virginia, um, you could actually put less solar in West Virginia than in California, but have a greater carbon benefit. Um, so this idea, and it's something we've talked about with RTOs, and I'm going to talk to the Minnesota Commission. Um, it's also a, an open event uh, uh, tomorrow morning at 9:45 um, about this. Uh, it's kind of a preview to what I'm going to do with them. Is that we're missing a huge part of our um, RTO planning uh, infrastructure because we don't track any of these goals. We don't track how um, decarbonization efforts uh, have gone through through um, measuring data from the RTO. So all this data exists, but nobody's, uh, at least to my knowledge, is, is is given access to it and quantifying it. And so it, it, you know it could be um, we talk about this internally, but it could actually be a greater carbon benefit to put to locate a, a generator a smaller generator in one part of Minnesota or Illinois than it is to put a much bigger generator or another just based on um, uh, LMP prices, congestion, um, and other things. So uh, one of the things that Emirates is not, uh, so we are tracking, we, we track in some ways an EM and V uh, that can be a loaded term in, in energy, but we don't make policy decisions. So we implement policy decisions made by state commissions and legislators and put them into software code. Um, so this is uh, our geographic footprint. You can see uh, a lot of people because they uh, they think that we're regional. I I, I use this. Um, these are the states where the shaded uh, green is where we track renewable. Um, uh, if there's a renewable portfolio standard, we will track them. Um, in some cases, there isn't. Um, but and then here is this overlay of. Um, I spoke with this about the professor earlier, this kind of balkanization, and sorry, it's a little bit fuzzy of these tracking systems. Um, but unfortunately, um, because of the competing interests, so our competitor APX um, manages most of these tracking systems. They don't really allow a lot of interoperability. Um, um, they claim it's because states don't want it. But unfortunately, what ends up with is um, it's very difficult to transact certificates across these markets. And as one of the things we just heard um, um, from the professor, but also that we'll, we'll look at some data on that the voluntary market, which doesn't really care about um, these uh, arbitrary uh, RTO level or state commission requirements about qualifications for RPSs, they want a more national approach to, to these markets. Um, so just probably so we understand, um, Ben, uh, the GATS organization is is that something that's very transparent? Uh, is there transparency there, or uh, everything is proprietary here? So um, P PJM actually owns their own system, but it was built by APX. So they they are a for profit subsidiary of PJM, which is a which is a for profit entity. They do um, you can look at their website. They do publish information. They do have a residual mix. Um, uh, but in terms of um, uh, you know, in terms of provide, like we don't even we don't provide access to our our code, but we have an API where you could pretty much understand our data model if you looked at it. Uh, it's a lot different, I think, with the other systems. Okay. Uh, so uh, here we have what is a what is a rec equal um, or, or what does it represent? Uh, so those of you that are, aren't familiar, I, I know it's, it's fairly elementary, but it's always important that once you put electricity onto the grid, it travels under the laws of physics. Uh, so you have this null power, which goes into power markets, ISOs or distribution markets, if they exist. And then you have a REC, which is decoupled, uh, the environmental attribute decoupled from the physical commodity of electricity, and then goes into these different markets. The voluntary market, which is corporates or, or, or homeowners or other people that aren't required to buy energy. And then when we say renewable RPSs or compliance market, we're talking about when states utilities are required to buy uh, electricity. And here's what a, 
a rec looks like from a data perspective in our system. You have a generator ID. Uh, every rec looks like uh, looks like this. A, a state, uh, the month and the year, uh, a, a unique identifier which our our system randomly assigns. Um, some systems don't even do that. They just have. Uh, uh, they just go in sequential order. Um, RECs aren't really, pr they're not printed off. They're not, they're not um, physical certificates. So it's pretty hard to, to counterfeit them. Although you would be surprised there was a, a while where um, there was a scam where people in the UK pensioners were being sold uh, REC certificates as investments. Uh, and unfortunately they would sometimes call us and ask them what their investment is worth. And you'd have to say like nothing because there's no, uh, everything lives in the system. There's no actual physical certificates. Um, but here you have um, yeah, 3,119 RECs. They can be split into one megawatt increments, but not smaller. Um, and I think this might be interesting for, for some of the data people on the call, but, um, uh, uh, and I need to run the, the 2019, I, I apologize, I don't have it, but the, um, it's slowed down a little bit, but one of the things you can see um, is the, the really the rapid growth of solar. And that has to do uh, a lot with what ha has happened in Minnesota with um, uh, the, the, the solar carve outs of the RPS that required uh, one and a half percent for Excel and 1% for other utilities. And then 10% of that to be small solar. Um, you have a really a rapid increase in solar um, and averaging since 2010 of, of over 125%. Obviously, most of that is concentrated between 2016 and, 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 and 2018. It's starting to level up, but it's still pretty significant. Um, and then you have here, even with wind, uh, we tend to think of the, the upper Midwest where, well, we track everywhere. A lot of that growth as of 2018 was still upper Midwest. So you have a, a ton of wind um, in, in, in there. And, and so I think um, this is a really fascinating if, for those of you that are interested in this and the data behind it, NREL has really great reports and I've linked to them uh, down here. This is one of their most recent reports um, that uses 2018 data. Uh, but I think what's fascinating in, in, in 2018, you had about 6.3 million customers procured about 134 million megawatt hours of renewable energy through green power markets. Um, that's an increase from 2017 of about 20%. Uh, uh, more and uh, from uh, 800,000 uh, new customers. So uh, it was about five and a half million customers in 2017 um, uh, with a 20% increase. So it's a, you're, we're seeing that growth um, uh, you know, continue. Uh, and then uh, in terms of utility green pricing programs, it was a, a little under a million, so 966,000 customers procured about 9.7 million megawatt hours of renewable energy through utility uh, contracts, um, which is about 9% growth from 2017 to 2018. Um, a lot of that's now coming from solar. So uh, solar uh, accounts for about 19% of utility green pricing pro programs, uh, which uh, that's up 5% from 14% in 2017. And in 2013, it was just 2%. So you're seeing a lot of interest in solar. I think um, there's a lot of, uh, in terms of just from a sales position, people have a real interest in solar. They think of it as more local or, or there's a greater impact. Um, and then 2018 was the first year that solar accounted for more than 10% of green pricing sales um, in smaller programs. So uh, not the top 10 in sales, but we're talking about these smaller customers. So does Minnesota have a net metering program? Yeah, so Minnesota has uh, net metering. It also has, uh, Excel has some pretty substantial uh, programs. Uh, so as long as you qualify, you're under those caps for 40 kilowatts and it has to be sized to, I think you can't be more than 110% of your, your average load. I'm not sure if it's over the previous year or five years. So you can't oversize the, the the systems. Um, I think what we're one of the things we're also seeing, and, and you can see this in this upper, um, is the the PPA market. So um, uh, through the end of 2018, there was about 740 megawatts of, of capacity that was procured, which which generates about 2.3 million megawatt hours. Um, uh, the and this what's interesting is these were announcements, but a lot of these will will be in the process of being built right now because of the uh, the um, the PTC, so we're starting to see a lot of that that uh, that come on. Uh, 
So um, just from NREL's data, there was about 270 major PP off, PPA offtakers that procured about 23 and a half million uh, megawatt hours uh, through PPAs in 2018. Um, and that was a growth of about 19%. Uh, so it's a lot, we're starting to see a lot of growth. Um, a lot of that uh, is trying to take advantage of the PTC as well. So we're starting to see those numbers kind of taper off, but uh, they're still there. I think this is a really fascinating, um, uh, it's probably for those of you that are familiar with this, it's, it's obviously um, uh, you, you, you know what's happening, but we're really, um, we're really blurring the distinction between um, generation and consumption and um, people, uh, I, I, I was talking with, with some people, I, people still don't really look at their electricity bills. And so I'm not um, a big fan of the whole uh, uh, um, uh, prosumer uh, energy trading that you know we're gonna be buying and selling electricity from our homes because I don't think people wanna do that. And even if we automate it, it's really just gonna probably, um, if it, with, with the smartest people writing the code to automate these programs, you're really just gonna probably be back around uh, utility um, uh, uh, prices anyways. Uh, so a lot of the people that wanna do it tend to be the people where I'm in the room with that are brokers or traders who are like, yeah, I'll arbitrage my, my neighbors until they get upset that you're making all this money uh, off of them. But we, we are, um, electricity is really so critical to everything that we do. And there is an interaction um, with, with what's going on. And uh, this idea of generation and consumption will continue to be blurred um, as, as we move into the future. Um, and, and this is where um, MRETS is really going um, uh, in terms of, uh, we're the first system in the world to have hourly data. So we actually get um, uh, from MISO uh, all of our generators. So the, we have over about 3000 generators in our system. Uh, and some of those are, it's actually quite a bit more because they can be aggregated. So small solar together into one megawatt chunks. But um, this is actually a real uh, generation profile from a, an upper Midwest generator. We've, we've changed the actual gross megawatt hours so no one could um, find out which one it was. But uh, this is the same thing with Midwest wind. It's pretty cool. If you look at it, they actually tend to match each other very nicely. Um, when you have the duck curve and then um, you have the wind really um, dying down towards the middle of the day, but uh, at, at, at the evening um, uh, when solar is ramping down, you have wind starting to, to ramp up. But um, we've been working with a lot of customers now to understand uh, what a 24 seven renewables product would look like. So you might've seen uh, Google has announced that they wanna be uh, not only, um, they, they have uh, their, their, their decarbonization goals where they wanna see um, to be zero or in some cases, some companies are negative carbon, but also they wanna match their renewables with actual load on an hourly basis. So we've, um, we have over a year now of MISO uh, hourly data. And we've been working with some of these companies uh, who make you sign NDAs, of course, and hopefully uh, late Q4, early Q, uh, Q4 this year, early Q1, we'll be doing some press releases with some of the announcements for the, the, the successful pilots or M MVPs that we're doing with them to help them match load to generation. And while uh, the, the process of matching load to generation obviously is fairly easy from a data perspective, uh, what isn't is how you deal with um, uh, all of the data. So RECs right now are issued in one megawatt batches uh, and they're issued once a month when they start taking on hourly attributes. Um, what happens if you start pulling hours out of a batch? So I'll show you. Um, we also get peak and off peak data from MISO. So these green highlighted are actually uh, peak and off peak according to MISO's FERC approved tariff. But if you start pulling out um, uh, uh, hours, um, uh, how, how do you deal with that? Are you going to have, you know, essentially second tier recs, for lack of a better term, that where the hours aren't useful to the company and they sell them at potentially at a, at a, uh, a discount? Um, how do we match that? Uh, because uh, usage data or low data is so confidential to a, a database, uh, a, a, a data center company. Um, do you, how do we provide them uh, a way to match what's in our system and their system? Uh, things like that uh, are all these questions that we're working them, with them to resolve. Uh, but then why do people care about hourly data? And, and really the reason is uh, they care about it because 
uh, they want to figure out what their carbon impact is. And so we are, we've been uh, given the green light by MISO to start putting this data on our certificates. But what's interesting is um, actually the EPA um, didn't officially ask us not to, but it was a, a nice, uh, we work, we do a lot of work with them, which is don't put, um, you know, uh, the grid mix, because what they were worried about is that if you start putting uh, what the margin, the fuel on the margin was on your certificates, it's likely people will start selling coal offset recs. And um, it gets into these really interesting ethical issues about how, um, how you make your claims. So for example, if you read Google's 24 seven document, um, and most corporates right now are counting the grid, but they are counting the grid in a way that doesn't reflect a real residual mix like they have in Neepool and PJM or in Europe uh, where they try to remove voluntary claims. Uh, and we're, we're trying to work with the EPA and people to understand how we could provide a residual mix. This is the example of the residual mix from um, in the bottom corner here from Neepool, uh, but people don't trust it, how we can, um, uh, so how we can provide a product that that um, uh, that addresses all these concerns and all this data and pr provide corporates a way to make uh, science backed claims and it's difficult uh, and again a lot of times my the developers that I that work for me it's not that 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 the data is always so difficult it's how we answer these questions and how we move forward um, any questions there. I moved through that really quickly. I'm, I'm quite interested to understand when when you looked at that load uh, as a loading of the two units as a as a resource from wind and the resource from the uh, thermal generation. Um, um, how do you come in as a third party? What is what is your role? Uh, are you just tracking it for informational purposes, or uh, do you have any role in terms of sharing some insights about the market or uh, what, what role do you play? Yeah, so we we do a lot of data sharing, obviously, with 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 commission staff and commissions. Uh, we provide a decent amount of data um, as long as it's not um, uh, it's not competitive information on our website. So which generators we, we provide you know, um, annually after the Minnesota RPS is done, we provide a lot of data um, on, on, you know, where the generation came from, uh, the type of generation resources used to, used to satisfy the, the RPS, things like that. Um, but there's always this interesting issue of, of what you can share, uh, what people want us to share um, uh, that, that puts us in, in a, often a very interesting ethical position. Yes, I would imagine. I had a question, Ben, on your hourly sure. data. Were you looking at, um, are they matching up their purchases in the uh, uh, ISOs, so fossil fuels, and then purchasing RECs separately, or is that what they're doing, as opposed to using total green energy against their carbon footprint? Yeah, so... Um, where where this came this twenty four seven idea came about, and and Google was really the first one to publish on it, but it had been floating for a while, in, in twenty eighteen, and I have some links to that. Um, was that people really criticized Rex for not being um, a, a good carbon tool, and 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 because you're just buying, you're averaging out over a whole year your purchases, and that doesn't really reflect the way that the market works on a, on, and actually in MISO it's a five minute basis, but but even more so on, a, on an hourly basis. Um, and so that's where this idea of being able to, to actually match your um, your actual generation with, with, uh, with the grid. And so what a lot of companies have realized too, um, and this is where it gets complicated is that It'd be impossible to have PPAs that uh, that are always going to be 100% of your uh, um, of, of your load profile. So even if you get it pretty close, you're going to have to rely on just what some of the grid mix is. And a lot of these companies want to be able to claim the grid mix for multiple reasons, including that it, it's you have to over procure if you can't count the grid. And one of the things I've brought up when I was talking to those students, and I said they got mad last week is that um, more, more renewable generation than you need for something like this could 
lead to not only market inefficiencies, but, but building generation has its own carbon footprint. And so what you're asking a lot of these companies to do is build more than they may need. Uh, and, uh, um, it, and that has its own um, environmental impact. Thank you. Did I answer your question there? It's a- Yes. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, so uh, it, it's really interesting when you read a lot of these policies and one of the things we're trying to do, there's groups like REBA, the Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance, which is sort of a policy and, and organization, policy organization that's trying to get these companies to, together. But you see this meshing of, 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 of different policies. Target is actually gonna be um, Holly Ladd who works for Target who's um, uh, in sustainability and, and, and energy and is a real whiz at all of this stuff and extremely smart. Um, looking at um, one of the things she's gonna talk about um, with the PUC tomorrow is that you, the data that they get from eGrid, um, which is the EPA's uh, uh, data, which is, is, is pretty old, it's at, at its best a year old, but oftentimes four years old, is very different from what they're getting from some of the utilities and the RTOs and providing data responses to their questions. And so how do we, how do, as these companies want to reduce their carbon, how do they provide, how do they obtain and then provide data on, on that? And one of the, that's what we think is, is really um, critical and, and what we see as our role is helping them being that intermediary um, and third party data provider. Um, and and it, it really goes, I think this is, uh, I know this is specific to Minnesota, but you'd see this um, in, in Illinois, uh, although you have a, a restructured market that utilities themselves uh, and, and utilities that are thought of as more conservative, not just the Excel energies, which were really one of the first to issue 100% zero or carbon free by, by 2050. You have these um, uh, other utilities, uh, Minnesota Power, Otter Tail Power that are all Great River Energy, which is a, a, a co-op uh, G&T company trying to figure out how they can reduce their carbon because it really is the future of growth for utilities. Um, and uh, for those of you that are in this world, there will be a lot of job opportunities for really smart engineers to figure out how they can reduce the carbon um, implications of, of uh, or, or, or the carbon emissions on utilities grids um, um, to, uh, to bring large customers in. For example, Excel Energy work with Google to, to retire one of the Sherco coal units in Becker, Minnesota, and they're placing a data center there. Um, and it's interesting because these uh, data centers you know, aren't, aren't really the kind of thing that formerly, you know, that they produce 10,000 jobs or they're, they're pretty efficient. They don't need a lot of headcount, but they pay a lot of property taxes. So, um, and, and they can help reduce the, the, the property tax burden when you, when you retire a, a large coal asset because that really hits communities hard. Uh, I had a question um, sure. what you were talking about um, a little bit earlier. You were saying how you don't see the future of um, renewable um, energy being sold like uh, between just like resident residential customers. Like you, you brought up the fact that like a lot of people don't look at their energy bills and just see like how much uh, yeah. they're producing and consuming. I was wondering if you had any ideas of what um, kinds of markets or communities um, where that could actually be, um, could be applicable. Yeah, so first of all, um, don't, uh, I've been wrong on a lot of things in business and in life. So uh, don't let that dissuade you. Um, I, I, I love to be uh, for, for, for people like you to prove that wrong. Um, a lot of that really comes out of my, um, I'm not a big blockchain enthusiast. Um, and for a while, that may be a huge outlier in energy. And I wrote um, an article in Utility Dive that um, you can Google. It's um, don't believe all the blockchain hype. Um, and it's two years old and I still stand by almost everything um, because there's this whole movement early on that was um, that people were going to be buying, selling energy from their neighbors and you're going to be able to produce um, solar electricity from your rooftop. And then you could you can market it to your neighbors and they could pay you and you could make more money than the utility. And, and, and what ends up, I think, happening, which is, which is, I believe markets are the most efficient way to address a lot of these problems, is that you're then going to have people that will um, create uh, algorithms that, uh, that both optimize the buy and sell side. And so while someone might make a lot of money at first selling to their neighbor, um, their neighbor is going to figure out a way to pay a lower price. And does it make sense to, to, to decentralize the, the energy in our energy infrastructure like that? It's, I don't think it's a bad thing. I just think that we all have enough 
things going on in our lives that uh, that that on top of that, um, and I just think about it, we I moved from downtown Minneapolis because of two kids to a house in, in a inner ring suburb, and I have a nest and I have like all this stuff and I'm crazy about energy, but I still like, am I gonna be playing with the thermostat all the time? And um, am I gonna be wanting to manage the buy and the sell um, of, of, of energy uh, between my neighbors? I just don't see that as, um, as really the future. I'm- And I there's no legal framework for that. And, the, uh, and it's, uh, we don't have an independent distribution system operator to make that possible. So I think at this point, we might have all the blockchain uh, uh, algorithms to, to process, but there's no reason that a utility company will offer that service unless there's going to be legislation in that direction. I think even if there is legislation, I don't think, uh, I, I just don't see that as, as really taking off. I think where it has taken off more, we have announced a partnership um, with a with an Australian company, Power Ledger. Um, if you have a chance to look them up, I think uh, uh, Gemma Green is one of the smartest people I've worked with. I feel lucky that I get to talk to her all the time. And they want to build a blockchain uh, um, spot market for Rex so that there's a more efficient way to buy and sell, which I think is a great way to utilize blockchain, not in a registry model like ours, because it defeats the whole purpose of it. But still the whole decentralized market existing on a blockchain platform, I just don't, um, I, I don't see it. And as the professor mentions, it, it, um, having worked in, in energy policy for a long time, uh, it's, it, it's such a complicated, nuanced thing that if, as long as the lights are working, and this is the problem with energy, both the, the blessing and the curse, as long as the lights are on and no one's complaining, everyone's happy. But if you build out this technology and it doesn't go right, it's gonna be the politicians who uh, lose their jobs. And whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, it's not that always- That maybe a good thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, yeah. So, so regardless, it, it, it's, a, it's a very complicated thing. And you hear people that are like, well, we're just gonna disrupt it. And in disrupting, I mean, you've seen kind of what's happened with 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 um, blockchain uptake in in, in uh, currency markets, where uh, you know, blockchain is still a great thing if you want to sell illicit things across borders or escape the government's grasp, but it still hasn't really um, uh, crypto technology hasn't really taken off in terms of monetary um, size either. It still has a lot of weaknesses. It's not inherently more secure than other technologies, um, uh, things like that. So. I, uh, that was a long, um, if you disagree, I, I, I want to hear uh, what you have to say. I think um, ComEd, which is which is an Illinois utility, did have some some projects. I don't know where they went. Um, I was following them for a while, but uh, there's another big company, uh, the Energy Web Foundation, which was um, which was started by Rocky Mountain Institute and raised ridiculous amounts of money and said they were going to, you know, in a, like, disrupt energy technology and do what we did better, faster, cheaper. And it's three years later and they still haven't done it. Uh, meanwhile, we we built we built a, a traditional database that is extremely secure. Things like that. Uh, nothing is 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 100 secure because I, I had the FBI come talk, a cybersecurity expert talk to our board that if anyone tells you that you should run from them, but it's secure. It's encrypted at rest, and um, uh, and we built it in six months, and we've continued to innovate. Um, so I think we're still dealing with reliability issues when you talk about wind and solar. I mean, it matched up real good in your graph, but as we know, if the sun doesn't shine or the wind doesn't blow, you don't have that solar, but the cost are, for storage are still a little bit higher than I think a lot of people want to pay. You know, I mean, I know Google's committed, Amazon's committed, but they have, they have the bank account to pay for those things or they charge their customers in order to pay for those things. So, yeah. and their customers are willing to pay for it, right? Like they either absorb the cost or people are okay with it. Uh, but I think where you're going is, is interesting. And it's something that um, this college class I talked to really didn't like, which is that to, to decarbonize our energy infrastructure and our society, it's gonna take a lot of sacrifices. And um, if you wanna do it um, and you want to, to, to consider um, social justice determinants and all these other things, and again, this is, regardless of whether you think it's a good thing or a bad thing or irrelevant, if you want to do all this, it's going to be complicated, um, which I think makes it really attractive for people that are in the engineering spaces because we're going to need a lot of them. But uh, you know, 
storage has its own issues. I, I mean, it, we need to talk about the resource intensity of building out storage is, is, is huge. So um, how are you going to treat those uh, resources in your database? the storage resources. Yeah, so that's that's another thing that we've thought about which is as time is time becomes more important meaning matching recs to load um how could we track storage? So um I will give you an example clean peak standard which uh, Massachusetts is really the only state that's adopted it and it was a way to to incentivize peak renewable energy. We really um we're lobbying them because our I mean Selfishly, our system's the only one that could do it, but we, we didn't win, which is um, that, that it should really be time based and you can you can um, you should be able to change the time value of a certificate by um, by changing its uh, time nature in, in, uh, in, in a system. So for let me go back here. So if, if you were matching a generate generator to storage, theoretically, you could match the time of a, a rec was produced. With when there was incoming um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, meter, uh, uh, there is there is electricity going into the meter. You could match those and change essentially the time value of it um, to when it was discharged. Um, we've had conversations with with regulators and and, um, and corporates on how they want to handle that. It's still really early stage on, on how they would want to quantify that, but um, that's one way to do it. Um, but what, what unfortunately I think Massachusetts did was they just created bonus certificates and they created capacity payments. Um, I, I'm a believer that if, if you want to subsidize, if you decide to make a, a decision to subsidize storage, then it really should, the best way is a capacity payment. But if you want to track what happens in real time, our, our system could handle it, but then it becomes is it last in, first out, first in, first out. How do you, do you need to, to match the generation asset with a specific storage? Can you match it with different storage um, based on a preference? All those questions need to be answered. And that's why we've been working on these pilot um, discussions with, with corporates as well as regulators to figure out where they wanna go. So where is my go-to place if I wanna have an independent assessment of how CO2 free my energy is? Is it MRETS, which is going to give me that uh, uh, that information? Well, 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 that's our that's our goal. We're not there yet because there's a lot of difficult questions that, that we want to work through. Um, I and mean, we could rush them, but then there's ethical issues alongside of that. The the other piece uh, that um, uh, you didn't uh, touch at all about nuclear energy. You didn't touch at all about hydro. I yeah. want to know how that information uh, gets into your system. So we we track uh, a lot of hard, probably more hydro than than any other system. Uh, that's mostly because of the Manitoba hydro dams. So um, and those are interesting. I don't know if you've talked or or professor if you've looked at all. Uh, Minnesota Power and Manitoba Hydro had a a pilot, and I haven't followed up on it recently, but they were actually looking at using the hydro dams in Manitoba as essentially storage, um, because you could back off on the hydro dam and uh, uh, obviously increase the, the water uh, um, uh, behind the dam and then turn it back on in times of lower renewable energy generation. Minnesota and a lot of other states don't consider large hydro renewable for their RPSs, but other states do. So for example, Google talks about um, carbon free energy, CFE, I think is the, the word they use. And they, they actually consider nuclear as part of their zero carbon um, uh, uh, resource. We don't create nuclear certificates. Again, we have the authority to, um, uh, they do create them in the PJM GAT system. Uh, and that's what Illinois uses for their subsidy um, the, the, they're called ZEX or zero emission credits, yeah. but, um, we, we didn't win that. Um, a lot of it because a lot of those assets were already tracked in PJM. Um, but. And, and so your independence is, uh, not clear to me since you're so dependent on getting your data from the various uh, ISOs, RTOs. So how do you 
uh, um, determine your independence? Yeah, so we we get the majority of, of our of, of our information, yes, from the RTOs, but that um, uh, and we, we have to pay them for it and, and, and things like that. Uh, we also get data from SPP and we all, we do allow self uploads or self uh, generation uploads or or what we call qualified reporting entities. So third parties can upload data as well. Um, so so we get our data from a variety of resources. Um, but so I mean, our ultimately our goal would be um, uh, to I would like to see in this market and it is to have one registry that tracks across the United States that is able to capture all the different um, uh, uh, carbon data, um, uh, storage data, all of these things in one place. And I, I don't think that's going to happen. And, um, and and I do think that that entity needs to be independent, whether it's um, it's something like MRATS or it's a federal corporation that exists uh, independent and gets the data. But right now, um, what we have is EIA, uh, the Energy Information Administration, which is a, a, a creature of statute and, and has to have a congressional authorization to really do anything. Um, not only authorization, but money uh, provided. Um, that would be a good resource to to either provide that information and provide it. Any to the data community. they provide is typically not timely. Right. So um, this is where it gets into should the government do it. I had this really uh, interesting discussion with a, a, a federal government regulator recently um, or body. Actually, it's not like one regulator. And they said, well, you know, depending on the outcome of the election, if, if something happens, it's likely the federal government wouldn't use RECs as an instrument to achieve decarbonization because we didn't under the Obama administration's clean power plan. And my response to them was, well, that was a very different situation. There was a more liberal Supreme Court. The executive um, branch had to, uh, had to do something to meet the, the Paris Accords. And the only way they were gonna do it was through executive action, not through legislation. If, if, um, if the, the next administration is gonna likely achieve anything, um, it's going to need to have clear congressional authorization, which is why I think if, if, and again, this is not like telling you what I think should happen, but if you have Republican or Democrats controlling the House and the Senate and the, and the presidency, it's likely that um, among immigration and energy will probably be number one or two, because it requires, it, there's not a lot of executive authority to, to do this. Um, and so you, you, you know, you might see um, and we would press legislators, not necessarily lobby them, but would say that you need to have a, a timely organization that understands these issues, process this data, because as, as you mentioned, Professor, and, and I also mentioned, like the, the egret data from EPA is, is extremely old and inefficient, so. Okay, thank you. Any other questions while well, we have uh, Ben on the line? So I, ben, oh, sorry. No, you're right. Go ahead. All right. Thank you. Um, so I understand that now FERC is open uh, to carbon pricing plans from ISOs and RTOs. And I understand that at least New York's plan is to add carbon charges uh, to the generator offer curves. And so how do you expect this to affect RECs? And if you think that RECs will be part of any carbon pricing scheme? It's, it's a good question. And it, it's obviously we nobody knows. Although I would say that there's been prices on carbon in in European markets for quite some time now, and they still have uh, robust uh, renewable energy, or, or or they call them geos. Um, and there's a group called uh, Rex International, which does a lot. And I can hook you up with any international um, uh, uh, kind of tracking system or information if any of you are interested. But they. Uh, uh, they still have these robust markets. I think it's it's unlikely. Um, just as uh, one of the things people said, uh, well, you know, what happened after the last election? People are like, well, what you know, what's going to happen to your company now? And I said, well, if anything, we'll see more activity because corporates will step up. People aren't going to walk back their commitments. So I still think there's going to be a, 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 a great uh, emphasis on. Um, uh, uh, on um, just not just corporate, but state level renewable energy procurement, even if there is a carbon price, but will it, will it, um, 
will it erode some of the growth? I think so. I mean, we actually saw this. I don't have the data, the slides uh, uh, on this for you because I wasn't going to talk about like our revenue, but actually in 2015 uh, and 2016, we saw a huge drop in our revenue as corporates waited out what was going to happen with the clean power plan. So I think um, that uncertainty might, uh, depending on the, the way the elections go, change the markets a little bit, but you're not going to see corporates like Google and Facebook walk back their commitments. And they're still going to use Rex or some other instrument to back it up. I see. Thanks. Does anyone disagree, there any disagree with what I said or think I'm crazy? No, I think there's still a high demand for our goals for 2030 and 2050 to get to the carbon neutral or clean energy. And you don't have enough renewable energy out there yet to get, you know, but there's, we still have to weigh the risk as you were mentioning earlier, whether it's reliability or cost or, and it is 2020, so who knows what's gonna happen tomorrow. Yeah, and I would say one of the things that we've been pushing the hardest on is that the data standardization or, or I say harmonization at the very least, because even just having similar systems is so critical. But the fact that there's so little data standardization in the energy world is, is really problematic. And uh, we're, we're trying to push for that, but there's no reason why, I mean, Professor, you mentioned um, getting data from RTOs or ISOs. I mean, we'd love for, I mean, all these, these meters are um, on, on large generators, but now even small generators are, are um, Wi-Fi or communication uh, connected and, and usually through encrypted means. There's no reason why we, they couldn't give us that data um, uh, uh, right away, but because of the lack of standards to manage all that for a hundred different meter uh, companies, we could do it, but it would be really burdensome and difficult and it leaves you open to, to issues. So if there were data communication standards, which they are being worked on, but so far behind, um, you know, it's, uh, that's something that we would really, really like to see um, and push on because it will, um, it will make uh, our, our, our processes run better, not just us, but the, the energy markets in general. So we deal with that. I'm, I'm a university employee with you, uh, system utilities, but I help run uh, Prairie Land Energy, which you support us with your Emirates system since 2015, 2016 for some of our wind uh, purchases, power purchase agreement, which we get the RECs, you transfer the RECs to us. And then as well as the solar farm that's on campus, uh, you also transfer the RECs to our Emirates account on that so we can retire or use them. And you had a, a line item up there before. One way I think about it, it said, uh, I think you had double, double benefit or double account. And the way I look at that is um, it's more of a double benefit. So you can't retire it and turn around and sell it. Puts it in perspective for, for me, maybe I'm a left brain or right brain, but so people aren't benefiting twice from that wreck. Now, what Ben does is allows, you know, he transfers them and we can, we can see them. And then uh, Morgan and, and the accounting group at Facilities and Services also is involved in that. And then they're allowed to, they're able to match those up against what has been generated at the plant and in the climate action plan. So it's, it's, it's worked very well for us. And um, your staff's been very easy to work with and very few mistakes. And then when we do have one, they're very responsive. Yeah. I think we've also used it for our LEED certification proof, right? So it's not just yep. being that we're using it in that way, but we will retire some specifically for one of the buildings to get one of the some of the points in LEED. Yeah, we yeah. did a couple uh, projects uh, back. We are building. Mm -hmm. There's going to be more. And LEED is actually thinking about requiring hourly recs at some point. Um, I guess there's some conversations. I haven't been a part of them, but... Uh, because they think the importance of actually like uh, of actually matching your building's load to to a specific generator is important. Um, and, and again, we don't we don't really take positions on that. We just think that we want to provide a tool that people can achieve their goals uh, within reason, um, as long as they don't impose unreasonable costs on our other users. Um, I but, think that uh, hourly idea is a is a 
good idea, but like you said, I think it's very difficult to achieve. Um, and having done a number of contracts or purchase agreements, who burdens that risk? And usually they want the buyer to burden that. Yeah. Um, Cause they can't handle, they can't have a 1200 megawatt solar farm and, and just cover a small amount of customers because their loads all over the place to cover their hours. It's how do you do that? How do you balance that? That's, that's an interesting concept. Well, and there, there was a movement actually among Midwest uh, universities to get together and, and use their market power to, to get, uh, to, to, to buy wind farms or, or to build wind farms, build solar together. But it was interesting because uh, inevitably the politics got involved and, um, and, and it became an issue of, well, what if it was, uh, you know, if it's a bunch of different big 10 states and the facility is another state that's not fair to be, you know, so ended up, they, they, I don't think that that has taken off. Now that doesn't mean they haven't been, other universities have been doing it, but it was a bigger, um, uh, kind of bigger issue. But where I'm going with this is that a lot of corporates are now actually uh, combining market power and buying um, or, or going into PPAs together. So they go into it without knowing who the other off takers are. Now they could say, I, I don't want it to be one of my competitors or, you know, you could put um, in, in, in some of these, these uh, essentially aggregators will, will find people to go in so you can get it cheaper per megawatt hour, hour cost. But, but interestingly enough, a lot of these, these contracts don't dictate who owns what hour they haven't thought. So then you're gonna have future contractual issues come up because if, if hourly accounting becomes important to, to people, um, you know, each different hours are gonna have different values and that hasn't been thought through. And so even just having those conversations with with some of our um, the the pilot participants has been interesting because they're they're just you know in some ways like simple logistical questions but have huge implications for for relationships and, and contractual disputes. Isn't it true well, that um, most of the net metering systems makes the utilities the owner of the recs with anything they purchase from their um, individual customers, residential? Yeah, so almost universally, if you're getting above market uh, uh, for your uh, for your energy, you are transitioning all your environmental attributes to the, uh, and that's what what's different about um, you know people will say uh, I get this call quite a bit. It's like, well, I saw that wrecks are worth five hundred dollars on the East Coast, or four hundred dollars. Uh, um, should I keep my wrecks? And, and I have to explain to them that you'd be lucky to get a buck in the Midwest for your wrecks. Um, so you just need to decide, do you, do you want your, um, your net metering agreement or do you want to, um, your recs? And then the other thing is, is that this was an issue fairly substantially with, with solar gardens where people thought they were buying renewable energy. And what you're really doing is you're buying into a generator that sells renewable energy, including most often the environmental attribute to the utility at a higher price. And so... You're not really just being a member of a solar garden doesn't mean that you're consuming renewable energy at your house. Um, it just means you're selling it to the utility. Um, not every case, and it depends on the agreement, but those are, um, you know, the the interesting ethical quandaries that we've created in, in these markets. It shifts the cost, right? Yeah. So if you're if you're keeping the racks, you're going to pay more than if they're getting them. Um, you mentioned a, a term fair for the say the Big Ten or the Midwest, and we're not entitled to any of the Illinois block purchase programs or solar for all because we're on private property, we're a private utility, and we don't have a direct interconnect. So that keeps us from receiving some of those benefits or incentives like that. So yeah, that's another balance for us, even though we pay into those programs. Well, that's, I didn't even realize that. So, I mean, I knew, you know, like cooperatives in Wisconsin are able to, to qualify for it because they're not rate regulated, but because you're Co private. Yeah, co-op, yeah, co-ops can, uh, utility and municipalities can. Yeah. But since yeah. we're a private, considered a private utility, we cannot. And there's, and the interconnection is huge, so it's not flowing out onto, uh, into the grid. Kevin, do we own uh, uh, do we own the Rex? Do we get the Rex from the first solar plant? Uh, solar plant. Yes, camp? yes, we own all the Rex for those. 
and then we'll own all the racks for solar. That, uh, I, that I know. So, I saw that in the to uh, use release, uh, but I didn't. I wasn't sure about the first one. And then we have um, a wind uh, power purchase agreement that's about twenty-five thousand megawatt hours a year that we receive Rex from as well. So I think Morgan's at uh, you. You're pushing. Yeah. Thirty. We had um, yeah, thirty-two thousand, I guess, in FY twenty. But we had um, part of that was actually the ECE building made our on-campus small-scale solar up to three hundred thirty-five Rex. Now those we're not um, reporting, we're not tracking in MRETs. There's, it's like a, a roof here, a little array over there, 14 kilowatts in one place. And, but with now that the ECE building has its huge roof array, it's notable amount for us, 300. Yeah, and we can talk mm -hmm. about adding, if we need to add that to the Emirates uh, account, as well as uh, we'll have to plan to add the M, uh, Solar Farm 2 to it as well. But we can talk to Ben about that, not more everybody with those details. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I, I got to run to uh, a planning meeting to talk to my developers about hourly data. Um, Thanks very much. We appreciate I, I really appreciate this. And and please reach out to me um, to talk uh, if you're curious, if there's people I can introduce you to for the students uh, and the non-students, whatever. Um, we really view our role as trying to help stimulate these markets and, and look at innovative ways to address environmental issues. So to the extent we can help, I will uh, always do that. Good, well, thank you very thank much. You. Uh, thank we'll you so be much. Touch. Have a great day. Thank you, day. Professor Gross too. I appreciate thank you thanks. allowing me to attend. Yeah, you guys are always welcome. We used to send it when uh, we, we still had a colleague there. Uh, unfortunately, he died very young. And mm -hmm. so I don't think we send the, those uh, announcements anymore, but I knew that Megan would be very interested in this. So that's why I sent it to her. Yeah, we'd, we'd love to get the recurring uh, announcements if you want to throw okay. them on the list. Okay. I'm sure Kevin, Mike, and I all would like to see yeah. them.